Janet Franklin. Janet is a professor in the School of Geographical Sciences and Urban Planning at Arizona State University. And prior to that, she spent about 20 years, is that right? As faculty at San Diego State University in the geography and biology departments. Um, she received her bachelor's, master's, and PhD from UC Santa Barbara. And Dr. Franklin's research focuses on the patterns and dynamics of terrestrial ecosystems at the landscape scale with an emphasis on the impacts of human-caused landscape change, as well as interactions between human and natural disturbance. And that's how I first became familiar with her work in the Pacific, looking at tropical forest dynamics following hurricane disturbance. Um, but since then, she's moved on to work in a wide variety of, of different ecosystems. And she uses a wide range of tools, from on-the-ground surveys of plant communities to remote sensing and GIS. Um, as well as species distribution modeling, a method for which she literally wrote the book. Um, she, in addition, she has over 125 peer-reviewed publications, and her contributions to the field have been widely recognized, earning her many honors. Um, perhaps most notably, she was elected to the National Academy of Sciences in 2014. So I don't want to take up any more of her time, so please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Janet Franklin. Thank you. All right, mic's on. OK, thank you, Liza, for that um, really nice introduction. And I uh, can't judge my volume up here, so if I'm too loud, um, tell my, um, my trusty uh, assistant back there, <laughs> the IT guy. Um, so um, that was a really lovely introduction, and I appreciate that you um, uh, kept it short and sweet. Just recently, I was introduced giving a talk by a senior academic who I actually have known for a long time, but he decided to, um, you know, kind of go off the rails and do his own research. And he talked about one of my really influential publications, and it was actually one that was written by Jerry Franklin. So <laughs> I didn't have the heart to tell him. Okay. So. <laughs> I'm going to, um, uh, and speaking of Western forests, I'm going to give you uh, an overview today of some highlights of a project uh, that we've been working on in uh, California looking at uh, climate change effects on forests in California's uh, complex terrain, literally. Um, so before I do that, I just have a little bit of, I just wanted to introduce myself uh, and a little bit about my history and, and what I, how I got to where I, uh, I am, you know, what I'm doing now and some of the other things I'm working on. So just a couple of slides that are uh, commercial, uh, commercials from, uh, from my sponsors. Uh, and uh, just to show you that, uh, and to start by showing you that uh, my, um, I, I come to this California forest question honestly. Uh, at my very first uh, research experience uh, as an undergraduate was working on uh, spatial patterns of uh, um, structure in California forests using the very early, uh, in the very early days uh, of Landsat. Uh, so my, uh, my PI who became my doctoral uh, advisor Alan Strayler uh, was uh, working with the Forest Service and NASA, um, and so this was my very first summer in the field. Uh, I thought coming to a, f a forestry school I should sh show you that picture with my Filson vest and hard hat and so forth, um, and working uh, in uh, up in the vicinity of uh, Lake Shasta of, or Mount Shasta. This is a much more contemporary Landsat image. The imagery was not nearly as nice back uh, in the early days. Uh, and so I guess my message from this um, slide is go into the field, <laughs> whatever, whatever that means to you. Um, and then I also want to mention a couple of other projects I'm working on, which oddly are, um, are related, much more related to paleo sciences. And I'm not a paleo scientist. Um, but I just want to mention them in case anybody has questions about them um, later or is, uh, is interested in them. Uh, and this um, is actually relates to a conversation I was just having this morning uh, that, um, you know, how do I uh, get dragged into these projects that seem a little bit tangential to what I, my expertise or what I'm known for. It's, it's through collaboration. And so to answer complex 
questions about either the past or the future, um, that collaborating interdisciplinarily is really the only way to do it. So, for example, I'm working on a project right now uh, in the Caribbean looking at the past, uh, but looking at effects of uh, humans on the environment at longer time scales. So for us ecologists for whom you know, 10 or 20 years is a long-term project, it's really uh, can be important to have this longer-term perspective on who's in your ecosystem, the species, and so forth, uh, and, um, and, and whether these historical legacies matter or not. So for example, uh, in this project where we uh, the, are getting a very good record of um, vertebrates, uh, vertebrate fossils from these cenotes or blue holes, um, these marine um, uh, flooded caves. Uh, we, we're finding, for example, so, um, you know, islands are also interesting microcosms to work on. Uh, in, uh, in the northern Bahamas, people didn't, or the archaeological evidence shows that people didn't arrive in the northern Bahamas until about a thousand years ago. And up until about mm, 950, 000, or 950 years ago, the uh, main terrestrial predator uh, in the Bahamas was a large terrestrial crocodile, the Cuban crocodile, which is still extant in one swamp in Cuba, a highly endangered and endemic species. Well, it turns out it's, it's completely um, extirpated uh, in the Bahamas prehistorically. Um, and the largest terrestrial herbivore was a giant tortoise. And so here is this beautifully preserved fossil with a crocodile bite mark in it. So this is basically a, a trap. Um, and, um, and so we can start to understand. Uh, and, and so these are just the big showy megafauna. In addition, they, we've ident we, my colleagues, have identified 100 species of vertebrates from uh, these blue holes from both um, the late Pleistocene and the, and the late Holocene. And so we can begin to look at differences in bird community composition, for example, and uh, really provide some context, uh, at least for the vertebrate part of the, um, uh, the ecosystem, that the species we see, the, all the parts are not there, and we're sort of dealing with the survivors, right? And so in, in uh, sort of moving forward, uh, thinking about conservation and future uh, change, uh, it's useful to have that context. So one other uh, example, uh, in this case, looking further in the, into the past, but looking at the effects of uh, the environment on humans. So I have had the privilege of being involved in a paleoanthropology project on the south coast of South Africa with a um, the PI is Curtis Marion from Arizona State University, and he's looking at uh, Middle Stone Age hunter-gatherer sites that span a time period from about 160,000 to about 50,000 years ago. So anatomically, modern humans arose about 200,000 years ago, so we were sort of very freshly a species. Uh, so this is really, um, you know, fascinating. I mean, I'm a humble botanist, but who's not interested in human origins, right? So what am I, uh, and so what am I doing involved in this project? Well, the, the paleoanthropologists are very interested in what was the resource landscape that, um, uh, that these hunter-gatherers operated in, in terms of um, food and other, other material resources. Uh, and, and that includes vegetation, so uh, food plants, uh, uh, plants for, that provided firewood. Firewood was critical for certain types of preparation of, of tools and weapons from different types of rock, and of course also coastal resources uh, being on the coast. So this is... Uh, they're, they actually have now, there's such interest in this project there, they've established a center for coastal uh, paleosciences at Nelson Mandela Metropolitan University. Again, how, you know, how did I fall into this project? Well, part of trying to reconstruct or understand what the resource scape was like involves um, you know, looking at the distribution of habitats or of individual species and trying to understand how those distributions may have shifted in the past. Species distribution modeling is one tool, uh, admittedly a rather crude tool, um, but to uh, uh, take, take a run at that. So if we look at these color maps where the 
bright colors are indicating the distribution of, in this case, a vegetation type called subtropical thicket. Uh, this is the current d distribution of that on the south coast of South Africa. And if we hindcast to last glacial maximum, First of all, the sea level's lower, and there's a much uh, there's a lot more land, uh, but also that particular resource uh, or habitat and the resource it represents, uh, we would um, predict to have been uh, much more restricted in its distribution, and so forth and so on. Okay, so back to California's forest, but just to give you a little pers that gives you a little perspective on me uh, and how, at least in my mind, uh, I think about the past as informing um, these predictions we make about the, the future. Uh, but you won't hear much more about it explicitly uh, from now on. So let me focus now on, uh, I'll give you some highlights from this project that we're working on. Do microenvironments uh, govern macroecology, or fondly, we fondly refer to it as M2M? Uh, this is a project sponsored by the National, the NSF's Macrosystem Biology Program. Uh, Frank Davis at UC Santa Barbara is the PI. Um, there's a cast of a cast of thousands. Uh, so I should um, I should say that one of my collaborators, Pep Sarah, is here today. He's at Harvard University now at Harvard Forest. Uh, doing a, a, po a postdoctoral project, uh, so he's come down for the day to keep me honest. So and this is, and you know, he's the one that knows that almost everything I'm presenting is work that he did. So PI's prerogative. I'll um, I'll use the royal we. Um, okay, and I I'd like to um, I always I'd like to list my um, sponsors and and collaborators up front, because sometimes when I wait to the end, I forget. So in, in addition to NSF support, we also have cooperation from a number of um, federal agencies, uh, as well as regional institutions um, at, at UCSB and elsewhere. OK, so uh, on to the, the story. Um, so, the, sort of the so the global um, projections uh, of uh, anthropogenic climate change uh, are the uh, are probably well known to most of you. You know, it's so, sort of at the global scale, the trends uh, that have both obser been observed in the recent past as well as uh, predicted uh, for the future um, are um, shouldn't probably come as a surprise. Uh, to anybody, so at the global scale, um, historical temperature trends, and then uh, and then future projections, uh, and uh, well, and, and then the longer term uh, projections from global climate models, with some uh, you know spread based on uncertainty, both in the models and in the. Um, carbon or greenhouse gas emissions scenarios, but nonetheless, you know, they keep adding more models, and actually, uh, the um, uncertainty to some extent is coming down. So that's the global framework that we're operating in. But let's bring it down to a regional scale of what's the fate of forested ecosystems in uh, in the West, specifically in California. Um, what, what are the trends and the projections uh, in terms of climate there, and how might that affect uh, forests? So the historical uh, trends are um, significant. In other words, there's been significant warming over the last century, uh, more so in the, um, the steeper line down here, more so in the Minimum temperatures, the average uh, minimum temperature of the coldest month, uh, minimum temperatures are increasing uh, more than uh, maximum. That's the historic trend. The, uh, the predicted trends for the future are, uh, for the region, are similar to those global trends. It's predicted to get warmer, and the further out you go with the projections, the more uncertain they are. So uh, mid-century, uh, this is a little thermometer for California, uh, mid-century, end of century, the um, uncertainty increases both due to emission scenarios, and then within those scenarios, there's uncertainty due to um, climate models, but there's definitely a a warming trend. Um, it's probably well known to many of you that the, for any particular region, the predictions about precipitation are much less certain 
uh, than the predictions about temperature. Um, but in fact, even and and the um, uh, predictions for California have ranged in the in the different uh, um, IPCC reports from you know slight decrease in precipitation to slight increase. Um, but the fact is, even if precipitation doesn't change, if it gets warmer, it effectively gets drier, especially in a semi-arid ecosystem with a strong uh, uh, strong dry season. So this is a a lot of interest in California um, because, uh, because it drives hydrology and therefore it, it drives um, uh, water availability. So both duration of snowpack uh, and elevation of snowpack has a big influence on hydrology, which affects water resources for people. Uh, but of course, that interaction between um, water, timing of water, form of water, and temperature also affects all the plants that, uh, that grow on this landscape. Uh, and so I'm going, so we are in this study, we're in, we are focusing on the uh, forests and woodlands of the mid, uh, mid elevations, uh, foothills to mid elevation mountains of uh, California. Um, so, you know, again, important for their effect on, on hydrology, for the uh, forest resources themselves, and, and of course, for um, as biodiversity and habitat. So just borrowing from this science paper from Dawson et al., we can uh, frame uh, an uh, investigation of how um, species might uh, respond to uh, climate change. Um, in terms of uh, you know different different things that might happen, thing you know species might actually tolerate the conditions uh, where they're found. Uh, they might uh, uh, shift sort of shift habitats uh, within a particular within their uh, biogeographical range. Uh, they might migrate. Uh, they might sort of track their climate envelope, uh, or they might not tolerate those climate changes. So. Um, we're going, even though we're, um, we're f talking about plants that um, don't move in the ways that animals do, we're going to kind of focus on the migration uh, question here. So species distribution modeling has been used as a, a blunt tool to estimate, I'll say, the exposure of species uh, or um, uh, other uh, um, you know, attributes of ecosystems uh, to climate change. So sort of risk or exposure. So what, what is species distribution modeling? Um, so the idea is that we can take a record of species locality data. This could be from uh, forest inventory plots, for example, for trees, uh, and we can uh, use uh, spatially referenced information, maps of environmental factors, including climate, um, that we expect to be correlated with species distributions and you know, maybe in a, even in a functional or theoretical uh, way uh, to define the, the niche dimensions um, of that species, its ranges uh, of tolerance, either to represent those either directly or um, indirectly. So if we can build a statistical model relating the distribution of species to uh, contemporary environmental conditions, and uh, then we can swap in new maps of, of climate as a, some subset of those constraints of climate projections, could be to the future or the past, uh, at an appropriate scale. We can apply the statistical model that we calibrated here to some new, new maps of predictors and come up with something uh, like this. Uh, for one of our study species, gray pine, here's a um, contemporary interpolated or uh, distribution in blue, and in the brown color, there's a, un, there's a predicted distribution under a fairly strong warming scenario with a little bit of um, overlap in purple. But in this particular case that I've used for illustration, not a lot, so in terms of exposure, Predicting a pretty big I guess, shift would be required if that species has to track its um, climate comfort zone. Um, so the premise of this um, of our study is that um, we know that this is a blunt tool. So what are the most uh, 
immediate things that, you know, what are the most important things we could sort of add to this framework um, to uh, address how species respond to climate change in a more realistic way. Um, so one thing that we can say about um, uh, trees is that they're, you know, they're made up of long-lived individuals uh, and, you know, they're plants, so that the, really the only way, they only move at certain life stages, you know, pollen moves and, and seeds can move around uh, the landscape, but, you know, the adults don't move very much, um, usually. Uh, so, uh, again, our, for one of our study species, we can think of this in terms of, uh, for gray pine, we can think of this in terms of, um, you know, individuals making up populations, ultimately making up this species range, uh, but that we um, can now start to um, take that apart into um, the life stages. And uh, if we think of long-lived trees, the environment uh, that's experienced by a, an adult tree that's 250 years old is very different uh, that the, than the environment uh, that's experienced by um, say, a seedling that's this high off the ground, right? So, uh, so uh, seeds uh, have to get to a site that's suitable, and those, you know, that landscape of suitable conditions for seedling establishment uh, might, uh, uh, can be shifting on the landscape as climate changes, right? So we started, at, we approached this problem as saying seedlings, uh, present a fairly uh, a, a vulnerable and critical choke, choke point or life stage uh, in this process of um, populations um, uh, persisting in a changing environment, in a, in a changing climate. Okay, so we're going to focus on seedlings, but then the, net, the other um, factor that is really important in our landscape is complex topography. It's a mountainous, very tectonically active, lots of relief uh, type of a landscape. Uh, and so here's kind of a typical um, vegetation mosaic uh, you might see in, say, the foothills of the coast or in the coastal ranges of, um, of California, where you see a lot of patterning uh, on the landscape that at least appears to be uh, uh, correlated with topography or terrain. Um, so um, the next uh, uh, premise of the um, uh, of our approach is that in order to track their climate comfort zone, seedlings may not, you know, have to move tens and hundreds of kilometers north or uphill, or, you know, or hundreds of meters uphill. They may just have to get to the other side of the hill that they're on, right? So, so, for example, um, this, uh, we can uh, take a top-down view of the same, uh, uh, the same kind of a light landscape showing strong vegetation patterning in these oak woodlands in California um, that's uh, related to topographic position, whether you're on a ridge or in a drainage, uh, as well as um, slope aspect. So um, this example taken from a paper by Dabrowski uh, showing a, a temperature map uh, across the terrain, showing those strong uh, temperature differences uh, in space due to um, differences basically in solar radiation or solar insulation, uh, just as a function of terrain. So again, you don't have to move very far, I guess, if you're a seedling to change your comfort, your, your climate, um, your temperature regime. And also, Different diurnal patterns, uh, differences during the day from a valley bottom site that uh, is pretty warm in the middle of the day and the, maybe you get cold air cooling so it's cool, very cool at night uh, versus a side slope where that um, diurnal range uh, might not be so great. So we're addressing the questions, how does topography affect species uh, exposure to, to climate change in the case of tree species? Uh, in this landscape, um, and what are the what are how does topography modify climate? What are those topoclimatic factors that um, uh, determine uh, or strongly affect plant establishment? And then ultimately, the question of the project is how do range shifts emerge from this uh, interaction between climate change, topoclimate, 
and plant population and community dynamics. Because even if we're just talking about plants, we can't forget about species interactions. Um, but we're, gonna, we're not going to get there today. We're, I'm just going to show you um, some highlights, um, mostly focusing uh, on the second question. So of course, uh, interdisciplinary co uh, project has a complicated um, conceptual um, diagram. Uh, and uh, so I just want to show you, um, I won't talk in detail about modeling microclimate. I'll basically show you some of the data products or outputs that our microclimate modeling team has produced. And um, I'll focus sort of on the um, seedling establishment uh, niches. So um, we have are working with climate scientists and uh, climate modelers and geographers who are taking data from global climate models and then dynamically, statistically, geographically downscaling them to fairly fine scale. So using relationships between, to, between topography, geography, and um, climate um, to um, think of it like if you're familiar with regression kriging, you're sort of interpolating climate station data, or, um, but you're informing it with things like uh, elevation and distance to the coast. Um, so that's what they're doing, and it's really quite amazing. Our, our collaborators, um, Alan and Lori Flint from USGS, for example, um, have uh, this is from work that they did where it it compares uh, um, climate uh, data. This is a maximum air temperature map shown at 12 kilometer, four kilometer, 270 meter resolution for some part of California. This is you know they they're using both historical climate data like. Prism maps, if some of you have used those, uh, and then they're actually, and they're actually. I just want to show that they are validating these downscaled data products against data. In the case of historical climate, the um, scatter is predictably a bit more for precipitation, um, but they the. Um, their work is really driven by this concern that the state of California has about water and its water future. Uh, and so that's why they're going to all this trouble to, um, in a lot of running, running things on work on servers for a really long time, to get these downscale data for the entire state of California. It's a big, it's a big place. It's a lot bigger than Connecticut. I drove all the way across Connecticut yesterday, and it took an hour and a half. So, um, and and uh, the fact that they're working with us, and they're even further downscaling this to 30 meter resolution, is just sort of a byproduct of you know kind of the important work um, that they're doing at the regional scale. But they're willing to do that for us. And not only that, you know, they're using these data, these downscaled temperature and precipitation data, and then they're pushing it through a water balance model. They call it the, their basin characterization model that US Geological Survey uses. Um, it's basically a, a water balance model. So it does, uh, it uses that, you know, precipitation and air temperature grids that we just talked about. It cares about things whether the, you know, whether there's snow or not uh, on the ground. Uh, from the terrain, from a digital elevation model, you can then, you also can, take into account the effects of topography on solar radiation, which you know, directly ev affects ev potential evapotranspiration in this model. Uh, and, and they, in a coarse way, they take it into account some uh, information about uh, soil or you know, about water storage underground in, in different layers. So um, they, uh, one of the predictions then that they, or one of the, the things that they could then predictively map from this uh, at the scale of months or average water years or so forth would be what they call climatic water deficit or what others have called climatic water deficit, which is the difference between potential evapotranspiration and evapotranspiration. So this sort of classic um, water, um, water balance graph uh, from a paper by Nate Stevenson would show, just shows that um, in a summer drought, summer dry climate, um, water demand or potential evapotranspiration peaks in the summer. You know, act, 
actual evapotranspiration peaks in the winter when there's water to evaporate. And so the difference between them summed over either a month or on an annual basis um, would be that um, deficit, that climate, climatic water deficit. Okay, so uh, they're interested in it for water balance, uh, for uh, water resources, um, and we're interested in it for how that is distributed across the terrain and might be related to seedling survival and tree distributions. So an important part of our project that was led by the, the team at Santa Barbara is the field component, which involves both putting uh, temp temperature sensors and a few weather stations uh, across the landscape and also conducting um, a common garden experiment or a reciprocal transplant experiment to look at the survival of seedlings across this topographic elevational and latitudinal gradient. So here's our study system. We worked at um, we, the, the latitudinal gradient, or it was sort of at the south end of the, towards the south end of the ranges of these forest communities um, as represented by um, these, in this case, the two representative pines of the foot, foothills and the mid-montane mixed conifer forest. So um, the sort of pi, ponderosa pine uh, distribution and foothills or gray pine distribution. Uh, so we have sites at the southern end of that range in the Tehachapi Mountains, a little mountain range that not everybody knows about. It's sort of links up the Sierra Nevada and the coast ranges um, at the bottom end and, and to the so-called transverse ranges of Southern California. So it's, I don't know, people who stud study lizard bio phylogeography and stuff are always really fascinated by this, this structure and how it's um, you know, affected uh, evolution and distribution of different organisms. But we're just thinking more um, biophysically in terms of forest uh, ranges. And then we have a, a, a site, uh, we have sites in the central Sierras and then a lower and upper elevation site, again, trying to capture um, these gradients. So at those four sites, these are the main, uh, the dominant pine and oak species we focused on. Uh, well, we, in our experiments, we weren't really dealing with competition for light, so we put our gardens in gaps uh, and we chose uh, species that are fairly light tolerant or gap requiring uh, for regeneration. You know, things like fire are really important, but we just deal with that later in our models. Um, so here's what the, uh, the four sites look like, the lower elevation uh, foothill oak woodlands and the uh, upper elevation um, montane mixed conifer forest. Um, so one of the things that we, so we have both uh, sensors in the field uh, lots of uh, temperature sensors, again, to sort of both to, uh, to, to validate those downscale products and also to capture what's, what's actually going on in the ground where we're doing these experiments, weather stations uh, at the common gardens. Um, so, uh, and, and so in a particular landscape, for example, uh, in the Tehachapis and Tejone, all the little dots are just representing uh, don't worry about the details, the distribution of um, gardens and other temperature sensors on the landscape across the topographic gradient um, of different uh, aspects and topographic positions. Um, so I'll show you just one, so I'll show you just one example from the uh, our use of the sensor data that we've been collecting. Most of it is temperature data, but I'm going to show you an example from uh, from soil moisture, uh, the, the weather stations have soil moisture sensors. Um, and so for a specific location, one of our experimental garden locations, uh, we can, uh, over a single year, uh, we can look at the measurement of soil moisture in the blue versus the modeled soil water content as one of the boxes from that basin characterization model that the hydrologists are running. So we can, you know, we have some data to actually validate the, the water balance model. Um, and this is just an example of that fit. So having done that, then uh, we can, uh, again, we can look at that 
landscape uh, so, uh, showing a, an elevation gradient. This is in the Great Central Valley of California, the southern end of it. This is uh, the Tehachapi, so this is actually the high desert, the Mojave Desert, and here's the sort of foothills and uh, montane uh, areas of that study area. So, and again, there, those are our, these are our, the yellow dots represent our experimental gardens and where all our sensors are clustered at these two um, elevations. And then using that basin characterization model, we can predict something, we can predict uh, the distribution of climatic water deficit across the landscape. Uh, so the bluer areas are uh, wetter. They have a lower climatic water deficit. They have a lower deficit. Uh, the orange-brown areas are the highest deficit, so those are the driest. So, um, and this is for a particular water year. I don't remember what water year, but uh, this is uh, showing dry at lower elevations and on the, um, the transmontane uh, side of the mountains and uh, generally wetter at the higher elevations, but also a strong effective aspect uh, on uh, water balance mediated by, by solar radiation. Okay, so now we have some fairly fine scale uh, information in space about these factors that we think or hypothesize are, are related to uh, seedling survival. Um, so that's the next step then is to uh, use those data to try to, um, to see if they are. If they are. So uh, those five species were uh, planted um, in uh, a sort of a classic uh, um, common, common garden experiment where um, all five species were, oh, so, so at each site, four sites, there are six gardens arrayed across topographic positions. Uh, we fence to exclude predator, predators and herbivores, mainly big um, uh, vertebrate ones like deer and bunnies, and we didn't always weren't always so effective with the uh, um, gophers, in spite of all the digging. So uh, at one point, the field crew uh, on this project called this called it sensing and fencing. <laughs> Because there were, it was a lot of work to put up all those sensors and all those fences. So in a um, classic reciprocal um, transplanting experiment, uh, you know, 50 seeds, we started with seeds, not seedlings, from each of the five species, from each uh, source area, Sierra, Sierra versus Tehachapi, were planted in two replicated um, plots in each garden in each year. Uh, there were three, three years of planting during the study. So that effort is led by um, the, a postdoc on the project, Lynn Sweet, who's now a, a research scientist at UC Riverside. So I'm not, that's a lo I'm not gonna try to describe in full the results of this. You'll be very relieved to know. Um, so I'll just cherry pick uh, some information from it. And again, I just, I have some photos to emphasize, this was a lot of work and it took a lot of, a lot of people. So to, uh, to put up the gardens, to plant the seedlings, uh, sometimes they even let me help with that, you know, if they, I, and to measure the seedlings. Oh, to collect the seeds, this is PEP actually. So um, collecting seeds from uh, very tall pine trees uh, can, be, uh, can be challenging. Uh, and, um, and then to just, you know, hope, hopefully avoid disaster uh, in the garden. So this was a tree fall. Fortunately, the trees fall in the winter at the higher elevations when nobody's there. It's very snow covered. So um, this one nearly missed a garden, but uh, unfortunately later another tree hit a different garden. Nobody was harmed, but lots of instruments were harmed. So, um, and all of this to track the fate, you know, of these, um, of these many tiny seedlings. Okay, so a, again, just highlights from some of these results. Uh, we can look at the number of seedlings that survived or the um, uh, proportion of seedlings that survived uh, per garden. So again, this is just out of 50. Um, as a function of that single predictor, this w accumulated climate water deficit um, over uh, a, 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 um, a water year, for example. 
Um, and the, you can actually qu explain quite a lot of variability in seedling survival um, based on that single predictor um, with some variation uh, between years and uh, so also some uh, variation in the fit. Um, but so, yeah, the results varied by species uh, and uh, sometimes by, uh, by year, but um, uh, in most cases where there was a good uh, predictive ability of these models, climatic water deficit was very important, uh, and sometimes a temperature variable was important. Uh, so I will just show you again an example from uh, one of our landscapes uh, of now we take those mapped predictors, climatic water deficit, say, you know, temperature minimum of the coldest month or maximum of the warmest month, uh, and we apply that regression model basically to every pixel in the landscape. And so, uh, so now we, uh, we can move to a map of seedling establishment probability. So here's an example for black oak Quercus cologii of the seedling establishment probability on a scale of zero to one. The greens are the high probabilities across this landscape uh, in a dry year uh, versus a wet year. So again, I'm just channeling work literally that Pep did, not, <laughs> I mean, literally he made these maps. So, um, so I'm just the messenger. Um, but so then I, you know, I can, I can brag about it, but I certainly don't want to take credit for it. Okay, so now we have, you know, we've done a little bit better than your off-the-shelf species, shelf species distribution model because when we're focuses, focusing on a particular life stage, we're actually using some experimental data to drive it, not just correlations with observed distributions. Uh, and we're doing it at a fairly fine scale, one that we felt was important for capturing um, uh, the effect of, the, you know, the hypothesized effect of uh, terrain and mediating um, species response to climate change. So then what we can see, if I can uh, make this lovely animation go. So now we have the same, uh, the same map at, uh, at, on a, in a particular year. Um, the, um, the color scale is the same. So the green is high seedling established prob establishment probability for that year and the browns are low. So high at the higher elevations, um, high on the, the moisture aspects in this case. But this, is a, this now is a map for another, the other oak species, blue oak. This is actually the low elevation oak species. The, uh, the current distribution of vegetation dominated by, as, by blue oak, blue oak savanna, so big old adult oak trees, is this purple pattern. So there's not a huge amount of overlap. It's sort, it's sort of offset downhill. Uh, uh, from uh, these sort of highly suitable um, seedling establishment locations. Um, and, and so this is, we took this to mean not, it's, we don't think this is entirely explained by um, shifts in climate over the lifetime of these uh, oaks. You know, they could be 100 or 200 years old. It could be partly explained by that. We saw climate trends um, in, in the early slide at that time scale. Um, but um, we also think, well, you know, if you, if you put an oak seedling, if you exclude competition and herbivory and predation and plant an oak seedling in a wetter, in a wetter place, it does fine. <laughs> you know, so why is it not there now? Oh, probably because species interactions matter. So, you know, that's, that's part of the bigger question that, that we're not going to get to t today. Um, but at any rate, when we, um, when we get to that question, when we put all this uh, together going forward, we have some, uh, some pretty fine scale and I think useful information about at least that, this particular life stage and how it fits in. So um, this is now uh, just, a, this line is a landscape average of um, how much of the landscape is suitable based on some arbitrary threshold? How much of the landscape is suitable for uh, blue oak establishment? And we see a slight but significant declining trend projected due to climate change over the next century. This is just one scenario, but we, 
looked at the variation between scenarios, and um, it's, that is still there. But we also see this um, tremendous, um, temp we, we see temporal variability, or we can now characterize the temporal variability. So now I've animated it, and we're stepping through the maps uh, and also stepping through the graphs. So we can see both temporal variability, windows of opportunity for establishment, uh, and we can also see a lot of spatial variability. So uh, whether you want to call those refugia or how do I get to the other side of the hill, um, it, it, at least now when we are uh, making projections uh, and starting to take those other factors into account, um, you know, we feel like we, we learned something about this important stage. Okay. Uh, and in fact, this is a summary again from a paper that Pep led that was uh, just, uh, uh, well, it's still in press in ecography, um, but it's online. It's been online for almost a year. So uh, you know how that goes sometimes. So I always have trouble. I should make Pep come up and explain this graph. But essentially, if you just kind of did the blunt tool approach, the, you know, 30 year, what's the, you know, based on 30 year climate ad averages, what part of the landscape is suitable for seedling establishment of a particular um, species, say blue oak, you'd only get these little blue areas. Um, whereas if, if you take into account this temporal variability, these um, you know, windows of opportunity, and uh, then a much larger area of the landscape is suitable for establishment um, in at least uh, um, at least some time during that time period. So this is sort of what you miss um, working at those coarser um, spatial and, and, and temporal scales. Okay, so that's, um, I'm going to stop there because to show any of our uh, other results would really be going too far into, you know, sort of PEP's work or some, my, my, my collaborators' work. You'll have to invite them to uh, come and tell you about that. Um, so, I'll just finish by saying that we got to uh, we got to this place with our you know um, laser vision on the fate of seedlings. I mean, I should mention that you know probably any biometeorologist knows this, but there's something about putting sensors out and and actually looking at those temperature data and the the seedlings. Um, it, it could be uh, you know. On a hot day in the summer, in, on a south-facing slope, the meteorological temperature, which is measured at two meters, might be, could be 40, 40 C, and the temperature at the ground could be 55 degrees C. So that's where those seedlings are stuck, right? I mean, so it's, it's amazing that any of them make it. But um, so, so uh, you know, we think all that's really interesting and important, and then we did this study, this four-year study and uh, experiment at the kind of at the, at the late stages of a 12-year drought in California. Um, and so I'll just, you know, stay tuned because there is, you may know, there's been um, pretty extensive tree mortality in California. It varies by species and it varies, uh, you know, space geographically across the region. Uh, Ponderosa pine is particularly hard hit. These are the ponderosa pines in our Tehachapi study area, for example. Um, and so any of you population modelers know that in fact, although we're all worried about the seedlings, if you have a long-lived species like a tree, um, if, you, if you do a matrix model, you know, 99.9% .9 of the seedlings of the, the offspring die every year, right? And you know maybe you get a little better, but a little worse here. But the adults that keep pumping out seeds for 200 years—that's really important to population trajectories. Um, so that's our next challenge: um, is how um, is to incorporate how um, uh, tree, you know, the adult mortality would factor into um, these potential f scenarios for the um, future of um, California's forests. Okay, so that was. I think you've heard me enough, and I'll stop there. Uh, and if there's time, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you.
Wow, I feel like I'm at hey. a TED talk or something. No, they don't answer questions. No. <laughs> um, thanks so much. That was a really interesting talk. I sort of want to probe you on tangents and maybe collaborators' work, but you you mentioned the importance of species interactions and including those in species distribution models, and there's been lots of discussion on, on how to do that. And I wonder if you or, or someone in your team is doing that, because it seems like since you're including the experimental side and the data into the modeling that you have a really nice opportunity to say, grow those seedlings without the predation fences and then be able to extract that data of like what predation is doing on seedlings back into the models. Yeah, so we, I mean that the, inter, the two interactions, you know, for my very plant forest um, uh, biased perspective is that the, um, the important interactions are both you know, predation and of um, seeds or seedlings, seedling herbivory, um, but also competition, competition between plants, big and small, different species. So the the whole plant community. So both both of those are important. And of course, yeah, we control for those by excluding them from our experiment. So we aren't dealing with that directly. It's it's beyond the scope of this study. If somebody would give us a, another grant, you know, another few million dollars, we would do that. Um, you know, we would, and, and you know, there's lots of things, uh, yes, and also, um, you know, growing, doing common garden, garden experiment under field conditions with, four, you know, uh, four years of drought, it would have been nice to get more variability in rainfall, and so maybe we, sh you know, maybe we should have done some greenhouse stuff as well, just to, to get at the basic, at the more basic questions that all, so we are relying on, you know, to get at those other things, we're, what, we're using models downstream that take into account those factors, but we're using other, we're using the literature to parameterize those models. And I can speak more to the, so, um, you know, I'm, again, I'm speaking out of school here. My, I should have my colleague, Helen Regan, who does the sort of more of the population level modeling. You know, they, you know, to take into account something like um, predation, they would just, change the survival rate at a certain stage, right? Or something like that. They'd, they'd add in some factor that it, based on hopefully some real data um, that says this many seeds are produced, but how many actually, how many get eaten? So, and then versus how many actually germinate and stuff like that. So, so we're not using data directly from our experiments to get at that. And then similarly with the, um, to get at competition among plants, we're using um, these. Um, we're using uh, forest landscape dynamics models that have all the species in the all the plant species or the main the main ones distributed across the landscape, and so we're using our you know um, very reliable um, information from our experiments on seedling survival as a function of the biophysical environment. Um, but then we're looking at things like um, competitive interactions as a function of uh, life stage or um, size class, um, just using the model in a, mo those models. We're, um, one of the models PEP is using is called Landis 2 that some of you might be, have heard of. Um, there are other forest um, landscape simulators. But again, we're always combing the literature to find those, um, to parameterize those models. And, and some, of the, some of that information is easier to find than, like, you know, there's lots of good stuff on oak, you know, acorn predation and stuff. There's some great research on that. So it, and, and, then, and then there's probably, and there's also great, great work on certain species, like forest species, if they've, you know, like pines or something, if they have, had silvicultural importance, and so there's this, you know, legacy. But then other things are just like, you know, California buckeye, Aeschylus californica. And nobody knows anything about the ecology of it. So that wasn't, yeah. I wish we could do it all ourselves, but we. That's why we have to have a network. To... Um, maybe I missed this, but did you um? Did you run your model backwards and show how like historical predictions of where seedlings would do well match where current mature? Yeah, we didn't. Um, we have run the model backwards. I don't. We haven't. Um, 
Have we pep, have we compared it to masting years? Have, could predict the adult distribution by going backwards. My guess is that it's difficult to go, I mean, how backwards do you have to go for an oak? Who caught the oak right. and how, you know, we don't know the age of the oak. And we only have a, up until the beginning of the century, 20th century, so I would imagine that even if I go backwards, I'm not really, I don't know how to, you know, compare that because I don't know the age of the adult anyway. So I think, it's, yeah, so we can compare it in a qualitative way to, well, we know that was a really wet year. That was an El Nino. And then we have this model that distributes that, that higher moisture balance across the landscape. And so we would have um, you know, predicted a, a big year for oaks. And those are typically really pretty well documented, um, you know, masting years or uh, big years for oaks. But, but again, that's just the, so we haven't, we've, we've compared it at least in a qualitative way, but that doesn't always, uh, a big year of seedling establishment doesn't always translate into a cohort uh, that s survives to be long-lived adults. And the, the, if anybody knows anything about oaks in California, the, I mean, there's a lot going on, and, and, they, are, um, uh, and they are very long-lived. And so you know, the great mystery is, why, why are they still here? Are they the living dead? Because you know, they're all 250 years old, and where are the seedlings? And, and, and so forth. So it's hard. We, we couldn't come up with it like a strong pattern of, um, we couldn't go back far enough to do that, but we could at least say 1993, El Nino year, you know, the literature says blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, good question. So there's still a lot of um, reports and initiatives and um, sort of plans using mean. Um, mean climate data and adult distributions to make projections and also adaptation plans moving forward. Given what you've just said, what's the utility in any of those efforts? Um, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I guess we, we borrow, we borrow the, the language from um, that others have proposed that um, maybe that is a a broad brush estimate of exposure to climate change risk. You know, if you see um, large discrepancy, if you just use these cartoon models, if you will, these sort of, uh, you know, climate averages, you're, all these built in assumptions that climate's, climate's the most important thing, constraining the, the observed distribution that the species is in equilibrium with climate. So I guess it, I guess, I guess what I would say is, that those kind of projections should be used really carefully in terms of what kind of organisms you're even talking about and how important you think those other factors are. And so it may be a useful first cut at exposure, you know, the idea that a species, uh, in order to track its, uh, the climate envelope it currently occupies, a species has to move further in a flat terrain than, uh, than up a slope, you know, to get to the same sort of temperature regime. And, and so, um, you know, th that's, it's, it's a good first cut, uh, but then depending on the, um, the, the species or actually the community that you're working in, um, the, uh, then you go on to the next step, which is to think about these other factors. So, you know, it's, those kind of very broad, broad studies have been done. Um, I'm not sure I'd keep doing them. Again, in, except if, it's, if you're talking about a region where you, we haven't even made those sort of first cut approximations. Um, I mean, and, and as you probably know, an, an alternative approach that um, has been used in the literature is simply to look at, at the um, at how quickly the climate is predicted to change across this lands, uh, across a landscape. So my, more the idea of let's just restrict it to climate. What's the velocity of climate change across the landscape? Um, and that doesn't have any built-in um, sort of uh, all these built-in assumptions um, about species equilibrium and, and species response. But it's sort of like that's a starting place, and that's when things get interesting. <laughs>
And we have, you know, we have, now we have other tools and ways of asking these, these questions. All right, we're getting okay. out of here at one. So let's oh. Janet again. 